to start. It's time to start. And before I introduce today's speakers, I've got a few brief things to say. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of the presenters. Uh, the slideshows and the PowerPoint presentations have really been just at a professional level. Uh, thank the presenters and the staffs at, at the Arboretums and Reference Gardens that may have assisted them. And it's just been tremendous. Also, want to want to thank the hosts. I uh, hope everybody understands that Jeff and Jennifer Harvey, um, Sherry Speth, who am I leaving out? Uh, our secretary, Sandra Hefner, they've, they've all done a great job. They've all volunteered behind the scenes. They came in early on the first Saturday uh, with the presenters to work through any glitches that might have happened, and there were glitches. Uh, so those were taken care of, so we don't have to deal with them when the actual presentation took place and thank them all. They're doing all the work behind the scenes, admitting people, making sure microphones are muted and they've, <clears throat> they've helped make it go quite smoothly. And I want to express our thanks. Uh, the question was brought up regarding recordings. Um, these are being recorded to the Zoom cloud, uh, but that recording can only stay there for a limited amount of time due to the storage limitations. So tonight it'll be downloaded to a hard drive. Tomorrow morning at the latest, I will upload it to a Google Drive and it will remain there indefinitely. Uh, for at least a year, you can go and access it at the link. Speaking of which, the link was in the reminder that you got for this meeting. It had the link to just come to Zoom, but there was a separate link for the Google Drive. I say, and that link will remain in effect. The, all, all the presentations will be there indefinitely. So anytime during the year, go to that link and you can see them. Uh, one other uh, special thanks uh, to Sandy Hafner. Uh, she is our regional secretary and she worked very hard uh, on the emails. It, it's not easy when you have a region with over, over 500 members to be able to email without everything being filtered to junk or spam, et cetera. So she's divided uh, the membership by states. And I think her email campaign was very successful uh, based on the attendance. That uh, speaks for itself. So please remember Sandy Hafner. She's done a great job as secretary. And that's a large part to why the attendance has been what it is. And just so you know, the first meeting we had 57 and the second was 63. Last week's presentation was 70. And looking at today's number, we have 71 and I'm sure a few more were joined. So I thank all of you that have attended. I hope you've enjoyed it. Today's presentation is the Powell Gardens in Kingsville, Missouri. Uh, the, the presenters are Deb Gardia and Marissa Adams. And they've been kind enough to give a little background information on them as follows. Uh, Deb Guardias, obviously she's an ACS member, but she's also a sponsor of the Powell Gardens Reference Garden that we're gonna see today. Deb is self-described as a lifelong horticultural hobbyist, uh, AKA gardener with an exclamation point as she described herself. She lives in uh, Missouri with her husband, Gary. They joined the Conference Society in 2007 and traveled with the international tour to England in 2010. They were also presenters at the 2012 Conifer College, and they've attended many regional and also national ACS meetings. In 2015, they became members of the Powell Gardens. In 2020, Deb became a volunteer at Powell Gardens uh, dedicated to the Conifer Reference Garden. And has, has since became an ACS member sponsor of the garden, which we mentioned earlier. In 2020, Deb was appointed planning committee chair for the 2023 ACS regional meeting in Kansas City. In addition to conifers, Deb's horticultural collections include hostas, woodies, ornamental grasses, agaves, and succulents. Joining Deb today will be Marissa Adams. 
Uh, Marissa is from Missouri. She graduated from the University of Central Missouri in 2020 to a recent graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Horticulture and Conservation. After working at Powell Gardens as an intern and seasonal employee for three seasons, Marissa became the lead horticulturalist of the Conifer Reference Garden and now works full time at Powell Gardens. So I'll remind everyone to please stay muted during the presentation. Uh, when you have a question, don't wait. Put it in the chat window and uh, Sherry, Jeff and Jennifer will read those questions after the slideshow is over. And with that, Deb and Marissa, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Byron. Hope everyone can see that well. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our Zoom tour of the Conifer Reference Garden and Powell Gardens. Um, I'm Deb Guardia, and as Byron said, I am the one of the ACS member sponsors of the Conifer Garden and a volunteer at Powell Gardens. And here with me today is our co-presenter, Marissa Adams. Hi guys, I'm Marissa Adams. Um, and like Byron said, I've been working at Powell Gardens for about three years and recently got a full-time job there. And um, I've been the lead for the Conifer Garden for about a year now and I've been working with Deb for close to that amount of time as well. Well, so as you can see, Marissa and I are in separate locations today, um, thanks to COVID. Uh, we just kind of thought it would work out better instead of huddled up and having to wear masks. So uh, we hope all of our um, transitions and such go smoothly today. Um, and as Marissa said, uh, she was, uh, we're recent, we are very recent caretakers of the Conifer Garden. Uh, as she said, she was assigned over a year ago, and then I joined last May as a volunteer. Since that time, she and I have been working together uh, pretty much on a weekly basis, uh, evaluating all the conifers in this collection, and then just undertaking, you know, the required maintenance. Um, today, we are going to... Uh, well, Marissa is actually going to be introducing you to Paul Gardens. Um, I'll give you a little background on the development of the conifer garden. Then Marissa will give you a tour of the various conifer rooms. And then I'm going to share some of the specimens in our collection. So let's get started. Paul Gardens is Kansas City's botanical garden. It's located approximately 40 miles east of downtown Kansas City in Kingsville, Missouri. And now Marissa will introduce you to Paul Gardens. So Powell Gardens in total is about 970 acres. Um, we utilize 175 of those acres to be open to the public from March to December. And that includes our three mile nature trail that we have. And that is open from March to about October when um, the hunting season starts. At Powell Gardens, we have about eight themed display gardens, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in some later slides. Um, e. Faye Jones was the architect for the visitor center, the chapel, and the chapel study at Powell Gardens. Um, he and the Powells really wanted to honor the prairie grasslands of the Midwest with the architecture of these buildings. And in some later slides, you'll really get to see how they brought that to life. So we have several plant collections at Powell Gardens. Um, of those many collections, we have a hardy fern collection. We have an orchid collection, along with our um, dogwood and magnolia walk collections. 
Um, and we are also an American Horticulture Society and American Public Garden Association Reciprocal Admissions Member Garden. Um, a little bit of history for Powell Gardens. In 1948, George Powell Sr. acquires the land, which is now Powell Gardens. In 1969, he donates that land to the Kansas City area Boy Scouts of America. Um, this land was used as a campsite for many years, and then um, the troops decided to move elsewhere. And then in 1984, the Powell Family Foundation and the University of Missouri began the development of the Powell Center, which was a research and study center to evaluate the land that the Powells owned. And then in 1988, um, Powell Gardens becomes a nonprofit organization. And um, 1991 through 2018, you're going to see the building of our themed gardens and some of our iconic buildings are being built at these at this time. And then in 2020, we get our new entrance and this was very exciting. Um, we had the iconic Kansas City Shoes of Wheat that um, used to be displayed over the Kansas City Board of Trade building. Okay, so in 1993, um, our David T. Bills Woodland and Stream Garden is built. And this year we actually decided to install a tropical plant stumpery display, which was super cool. And we're going to do it in some future years too. So if you missed it this year, you can come out and see it. And um, a couple years before the woodland and stream was built, we actually transitioned the whole, what used to be the whole of Powell Gardens, which is now a perennial garden. And so um, it's kind of cool to walk around the perennial garden and think about how that used to be all that Powell Gardens used to be. Nineteen ninety-five, the Meadow Pavilion is built, and that's on your top right-hand corner there. Um, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner that is a view of our island garden, which was built later. But in the background, you can see a mound, the hill, which was a mound of dirt that we actually got from the lake that was man-made at Powell Garden. So we took that dirt and we put, we made a hill and now it's this beautiful, beautiful um, wildflower meadow pavilion. Um, 1996, the Marjorie Powell Allen Chapel is built. Um, and then right at the bottom left-hand corner, you can see our memorial garden that is just right down the hill from this beautiful chapel. Um, both of these locations are just very tranquil and a great place to sit. We actually do perform burial services and memorial services at the memorial garden. It's very peaceful. In 1997, um, our visitor center is built. And in that top left-hand corner is, that's the um, oldest picture of the visitor center right when it was built. So you can really see that prairie style architecture in that building. And then the picture below it is a more recent picture. So you can kind of see how the workers at the visitor center design and plan their beds around there. And then, sorry, did I go? No, you're that? fine. <laughs> I just wanted to point out um, the view of the visitor center on the right hand um, picture in front of that is our fountain garden. And um, it's just a, another view of the visitor center. And you'll find out why it's kind of 
special on the late on the next slide. In 2001, our island garden is built. Um, this garden is home to three cascades and an infinity pool at the very bottom. Um, if you've ever been to Powell Gardens, I guarantee this is one of your favorite gardens that you visited because it is so beautiful in the summertime. There's so much um, insect life. There's so many frogs and snakes everywhere. Um, the lilies are beautiful. It's, it's very beautiful to see. And in 2002, our gatehouse was built. And this was a special moment for Powell Gardens because um, it just made it a little more formal where guests could come and they could buy their ticket at the gatehouse and avoid walking through the visitor center if they didn't want to. Um, so that was nice for Powell <coughs> Gardens. And in 2006, this is the fountain garden that I previously mentioned. Um, it's a family favorite at Powell Gardens. In the summertime, all day long, you can just hear children playing and splashing around in this fountain. Um, it's great when you get to plant the fountain garden because you get some, you get to cool off a little bit while you're planting it. So that's really nice. And it's perfectly fitting for Kansas City's Botanical Garden because we're the city of fountains. And in 2009, the Heartland Harvest Garden was built. Um, this garden is unique in the way of it is a 12 acre plot of edible landscape. Everything in this garden, you can walk up and pick it right off the vine, right off the plant and you can eat it. And we have chefs that come out and we harvest the produce for them and they make these awesome dinners for our donors and it's, it's very cool. And on the bottom left, you can see our Missouri barn, which is a part of the Heartland Harvest Garden. Um, we use it as an event space. Those chefs, when they make their meals, this is where everyone eats. Um, and then you can see the stone silo that is attached to this building. And that is one of the coolest features at Powell Gardens because you can walk up the spiral staircase of the silo and once you get to the very top you can see the entire um, Heartland Harvest Garden and you can see most of Powell Gardens and it's a it's a really unique view of the gardens. And in 2001, Powell Gardens receives some of its first dwarf conifers from holiday train displays. And then in 2006, um, the conifer garden is created and many more dwarf conifers are added and we added raised beds. Um, and then I am going to hand it back to Deb and I think she has a little more to say about the history of the conifer garden. Okay, so we'll fast forward from 2006 to this aerial pic that shows the conifer garden today. And it's outlined in red. I hope, I hope you can see this on your screens. Here's the conifer garden. It's just north of the visitor center and it's adjacent to the fountain garden. It's a small garden at under, just under a half an acre, uh, but it is large enough to support over a hundred maturing conifers. Uh, the beds of the conifer garden are actually short berms that were made with sandstone rubble that was found during the excavation of the fountain garden. Now you walk down into the fountain garden, if you remember that picture Marissa showed you, uh, there was a lot of sandstone soil to, to move, which turned out to be perfect for the conifers because it's slightly acidic and well draining. And then I've included here a picture of the label used for all the conifers in the garden not to mention the thousands of other plants at Powell Gardens. Now in a couple slides, pictures from now, um, 
Marissa is going to be showing you these various beds of the conifer garden. But since this aerial map is up, I will we'll just kind of orient you here. So Marissa and I named these beds last year and we call this the East Bed. This is our Acricona bed. And this is the circle bed with a north, west, and south component. I hope some of you will recognize your friend Marvin Snyder, who we have to thank for the creation of the conifer garden at Paul Gardens. This picture of Marvin was taken at his home in his garden in Overland Park, Kansas. And I hope you won't mind me just taking a, a little, a minute or two here to share with you a couple things about Marvin. Cause you know, he's turning 95 years old this year. I'm so glad that I had the chance to meet him and get to spend some time with him in his garden a couple of times. His garden is amazing and he is truly an artist. Marvin got hooked on conifers back in the, I think, early 80s, and he attended a meeting, a conifer meeting in Chicago. Well, that really got him started. So he went home back to Kansas after that meeting, and he got lots of other people hooked on conifers too. And they started a conifer club and named it Pines and Needles. So Marvin's enthusiasm continued. He was served on the board of the ACS for several years and he was president from 1999 to 2002. So glad we have him. Okay, so now I'll get back to the conifer garden. Um, so as Marissa said, in 2001, there was a holiday model railroad display in the conservatory in the visitor center. And so Marvin donated several conifers to use in that display. Well, when the holiday display was over, those conifers were planted in the beds adjacent to the visitor center. And I think that planted the seeds for what was to come. Hmm. So then in 2006, and I should point out that the, the dwarf conifer garden was never on a master plan. So then in 2006, the, that fountain garden was created and they didn't know they were gonna hit all that sandstone soil, but when they did and they started moving it, somebody must've got one of those light bulb moments because it was like, boom, we should move this and make berms and beds and plant conifers. And that's what happened. And the dwarf conifer garden was born. Um, now at some time prior to all of this, Marvin had designed and supplied conifers for a technical library in Kansas City well, in 2007, that library was expanding and the conifer collection needed to be moved. So Marvin arranged for all the conifers to be hand dug and moved out to the new conifer garden at Powell. Um, time goes on and more conifers are added. Um, nurserymen are donating conifers. Some new beds are added, further defining that circle bed and then the last bed, bed added was the east bed along the sidewalk. So when the east bed was done, Marvin and the then director of horticulture went ahead and applied for and received the ACS reference garden designation. And here's, here's our plaque, which was mounted on a really nice chunk of stone that's in our garden today, along with a memorial plaque that's in the garden that's dedicated to Marvin's late wife, Emily. And then last year, Marissa and I teamed up as caretakers for the garden, uh, doing our plant by plant evaluation and performing the necessary restoration and rejuvenation as needed. Um, some of that work will continue into this year uh, and we will be further enhancing the conifer garden. So now let's have Marissa get you into the garden and take a look at those rooms. What you're seeing here is our east bed. So that was the last bed added to the conifer garden. Um, some of the conifers I'd like to point out are 
our Pinus strobus mini twists. Um, that's a really unique one to our collection. We don't really have one that has any resemblance to that one. Um, and then we also have a Pinus spongiana row arboretum front and center when you walk into the conifer garden. Um, and then we also have our Picea orientalis skylands. And that conifer does very well where it is. It has a nice bright gold color all year. And then the last ones I want to point out in this photo are our Juniperus horizontalis. Um, we have Motherlode and we also have Copper Harbor. Um, copper Harbor is one of my favorites because it really does get a beautiful copper color in the fall time. It's really cool to see. Continuing our east bed, um, in this picture you can see our Picea Almerica de Ruder. Um, and then we also have our Pinus Mugo Jacobson. And then lastly in this picture, um, you can kind of see it. It's our Juniperus virginiana falling water. Um, and we'll go more into depth about some of these specimens later. This is one view of our Acrocona bed. Um, in this picture, you can really see just how striking our Picea pungens blue pagodas are. Um, they really draw people into this garden. And um, the last conifer I'd like to point out in this picture, you can kind of see it, Deb will point it out for you. It's our Juniperus chinensis shimpaku gold. And um, it is really striking next to those blue pagodas. It was a great choice to put right there. Um, here are two other views of our Acrocona bed. So um, in the left-hand picture, you can see our Picea ABs Acrocona, which is why we named this bed the Acrocona bed because you really, it is the Acrocona bed. This Acrocona is, amazing and majestic and is really just a, a nice focal point of this bed. Um, and then right in front of it, we have our Ginkgo Biloba Pine Glen Dwarf. And that one is just really cute. Um, I really like how the leaves bud out in the springtime. They look like miniature Ginkgo leaves. So they're really cute. To the right of the Acrocona, you can see our um, Pinus sylvestris saxitalis. And um, in the picture on the right, you can see our Pinus strobus weeping white pine. And this particular specimen has been growing quite horizontally over the past few years. And so we're actually working on getting a brace for it this year. So I'm excited about that. That's going to be fun to do this next year. And this picture is um, a really good view for you guys to kind of just see the proximity of these beds. Um, so in the background, you have our Acrocona bed and then more forward is our South Circle bed, a part of it. So you can really see just the proximity and distance in relation to these beds. Um, this is our South Circle bed. This bed in particular is one of my favorites. Um, it does a great job of showcasing different color and texture. Um, you can tell when it was planted, the designers definitely had um, these elements in mind. Um, some conifers I'd like to point out are our Pinus densiflora golden ghost. And that one is just a pop of bright yellow almost all year. It's, it's very striking. Um, and then we also have our Pinus sylvestris Little Anne. And we actually did some sculpting work on that conifer this year. And it, it really looks fantastic compared to before we sculpted it. Um, 
And then um, directly in front, we have our Picea orientalis Connecticut turnpike. Um, that one is just a great specimen. Um, it really has a great shape and texture. And then I just want to point out one more right behind it is our Juniperus communis oblonga pendula. Um, you'll learn a little bit more about that in another slide, but that one is definitely a unique conifer in its own as well. And in these two pictures, you can really get a feel for the growth that this garden has had in the past five years. Um, so in this picture, um, I want to point out our Thuya occidentalis yellow ribbon, which is in the very back. Um, that just has a very beautiful yellow color year round. It really brightens up in the fall time as well. Um, in contrast to that yellow, we have our Picea pungens avatar. And that conifer gives off just a beautiful blue glowing color throughout the entire year. And um, the last one that I want to point out to you guys on this slide is our Pinus bengiana diamond, which was fun because that was actually a surprise to Deb and I working in the garden this year. We had no idea that um, we had this specimen in the garden. So it was fun to discover that one. And in these pictures, you get a really good view of the backside of the west circle bed, which might have some conifers that you could miss if you didn't walk to the backside. And um, Deb is actually going to explain or tell you more about some of these conifers. Okay, thanks, Marissa. Well, um, it's, I hope those pictures gave you all a good idea of the maturity and the layout of the collection. Uh, uh, now I am going to give you a closer look at some of the conifers. Um, I'll point out that there is a year listed after the conifer name, and that is the year that the conifer was planted. So we'll start out with Skylands. We have two of these in our collection. One's in full sun, and this specimen is in part shade. Both are growing very well. Um, and we do see though a much better yellow color on the one that's in the full sun. And uh, it's uh, showing really only minor burn for us. Then here in the lower right corner is one of our two Weeping Wonder ginkgos. Um, I learned um, about this, a little bit more about this cultivar and it originated as a witch's broom. Um, the form is somewhat pendulous, uh, but it has a really very random branching habit. So random actually that since we have two of them, we decided that we would prune one of them for size and shape, but this is the one that we're gonna leave to grow however randomly it wants to, and we'll keep an eye on that one. Okay, I chose this pick of the three bald cypresses in our collection so that you could clearly see the form of these conifers. Um, PV minaret is here to the right with the species in the center and PV yellow here to the left. Okay, so I don't know how many of you have seen a PV minaret quite this wide. I tend to see them more um, having undergone consistent pruning to make those branches much shorter. Um, certainly that seems to be a tendency when they're younger, but it is definitely displaying that upward sweeping branching habit that you really do see when they're young. Um, now yellow, PV yellow, is described as um, taking on a form similar to the species. And it's just very nice that this picture shows them so all together because I think you can see that PV yellow pretty much does look like species. Um, not really sure how big yellow is gonna get. Um, 
we'll just have to wait and see. Oh, the picture in the lower corner here. I don't know how well it shows up for you on your screen, given that these are the knees from PV Minaret and we have our pea gravel mulch. Now, we have several little clumps of those knees that are emerging. Um, and some of them are as far away as six feet from the base of PV Minaret. So for contrast, um, here's a pic that we took last May on our one of our early visits in the spring. Um, here's PV Yellow and Minaret. Uh, yellow is obviously farther ahead. <clears throat> now I learned on studying this cultivar that it originated as a chemical, uh, it was created from chemically treating seeds to cause mutations. So it's described as having a yellow color that varies from season to season and year to year. We only have one year to really, you know, give you any, um, for any reference, but last year it did emerge with this yellow tinge, uh, seemed to green up though, certainly by very early summer. Okay, here is just a really nice pair of 20 year old uh, lace bark pines. Now lace bark pine is one of my absolute favorites uh, because of this beautiful bark. Um, and as you can see, it's demonstrating its characteristic exfoliating tendency, big chunks here. Uh, then you can see those beautiful silver white greens, browns, and I've even observed in some cases what I think to be a bit of a purple color. Now I won't go into a real long story about this, but if you look at the shape and form of these lace sparks, you have to go, hmm, how, how are these the species? I came across some old inventory records and somewhere someone had written down planting a row arboretum in 2001 or maybe they planted more, but there's no labels that I could find on these. Um, but I, I'm suspecting that these could be, could these be row arboretums, uh, the cultivar, or did they plant another one and it's no longer in our garden? I don't know. The only way to know for sure would be to get genetic, test, genetic testing, but um, it's something I'm gonna be looking into. In the meantime, we'll definitely enjoy them. But here is the, we do have, we know for sure that this is a row arboretum lace bark pine. Um, and if you joined us for the first uh, reference garden Zoom with Jason Donovan, then you know that this was selected from the Stanley, Stanley MR row arboretum. And he showed us the uh, original tree that these came from. Now, Row Arboretum was the first lace bark pine I ever planted. I just think it has a really nice shape. I, I really feel it's a good choice for really almost any garden. And then as Marissa pointed out earlier, we discovered we had Diamant. Um, and this cultivar was cited as being the first good Bungiana dwarf form. Um, we really like it. it, has a slightly lighter green color to it. And I will point out, I'll take this opportunity to say when you see the brown and things, some of these pictures were taken after the bald cypresses dropped their needles. So you're gonna be seeing a little bit of that. Um, and as I said, it has the wider than taller habit. Uh, it is displaying the characteristic bark it's really hard to see. I actually had to just stick my phone down in the uh, inside the conifer and take that picture. But as you can see, it's starting to show the whites and greens and browns. Ah, okay, so we are really fortunate in my opinion to have two of these Tanyosho pines in our collection. I think what makes them outstanding is their form. Uh, it's easy to see why they're also referred to as umbrella pine. 
Um, but then you've got these just really bright green long needles and exfoliating brown orange bark, which is a little hard to see here, but, and then an abundant uh, cone production. So these together are definitely my, in my top three favorites in the garden. We, we stopped earlier on and uh, you saw the picture. Uh, we do have several Picea pungents in the collection, but I think these are certainly my favorite. The blue color is outstanding and it just seems to get bluer throughout the year. Um, and I'll, honestly, I, it looks nice, but I'll tell you my camera just didn't really ca quite capture just how blue they are. Now, I came up empty on my research um, of this cultivar because honestly, I was hoping I would be able to find one, a source and be able to buy one. Um, but it just doesn't seem to be out in the trade. So here's the second of the two pendulas that we have in the collection. Um, you likely see this from almost any vantage point in the garden because it's uh, got this definite upright form and it's just, it makes it just a certain, a definite focal point in our collection. Rosencrans is also a definite eye catcher in the garden all year long. This striking yellow color does not burn and it is in a full sun location. And it also doesn't really change very much going into the winter uh, like some yellow arborvitaes do. And it also has a nice, good, sturdy form, uh, which is proving to you know, be good for handling the winter precipitation. Well, everybody pretty much agrees uh, that they like this conifer, but Marissa really likes it. So I'm going to let her jump in and talk about it. Yes, this is my favorite conifer in our collection. Um, I just really think that the form and shape of this conifer is great, especially in contrast with what was planted around it. And um, my favorite part about this conifer is um, that it is a, an extremely soft spruce, which um, this has been my first year working with conifers and I very quickly realized that spruces are very sharp and um, you don't really want to walk up and grab them. And I like this one in particular because you can just walk right up to it and run your hand along it and it's waxy and smooth and you're not going to get poked and it is just a great conifer. So that is why the Connecticut Turnpike is my favorite. <laughs> Well, okay, Frankie Boy is definitely one that everyone who visits the conifer garden ends up touching at some point. Um, I've shown it here in both its spring and its winter color. Um, you can see it's really taken on a nice distinctive teardrop shape and we have not done any pruning and I suspect that nobody else has done any pruning either. <laughs> So uh, it's nice to see this, this really tight shape. Um, it's definitely a visitor fan favorite. Now, if you walk around the back side of the east bed, there are more conifers to see. And here's a dwarf farm of Sakulin spruce that really just recently kind of captured my attention. Um, it displays very nice, short, silvery needles, a reddish bark, and has very resinous buds, but it's also staying rather small. I like its shape and it's contrasting really nice with the sky lens behind it. And we have a variegated sparkling arrow off to the left out of view. Um, I think I'll be keeping my eye on this one a little bit more in the years to come. And we have a Pindostrovis old softy. 
I know this conifer may not be old, but its needles are really, really soft and have a very nice soft blue tint. Now there's only a couple references on the internet to this cultivar. Um, and the ones that I did see, the name was spelled S-O-F-T-I-E. And another nice thing about this is that it's since it's been in the ground um, for about 10 years, it seems to be relatively slow growing. And then down in the lower right is one I know that we all know, a little gem. It definitely is an oldie, but I think it's a really goodie. Um, I'm particularly fond of Norway spruce and this one doesn't disappoint. Um, it's 14 years old. And if you'll bear with me for just a minute, I'm gonna go back two slides because I just want to point out here to give you a better perspective, just how big it, it is really. But I think it's still a nice size and I think it would still work in almost any garden. And well, except maybe a trough garden when it gets that big. Our falling water juniper was named by Rich Air of Fox Willow Pines. And since I brought up Rich's name, I'll just mention that he is one of the nurserymen who made several donations of conifers to the garden. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't have a very good picture of the whole specimen to show you today, but I wanted to show you this characteristic prolific fruit display. Um, it's really quite stunning. The specimen is a pyramidal grower uh, with a somewhat open structure and pendulous foliage. Now one that we also like, but I'm sorry, I don't have a very good, I didn't have a good picture of the whole specimen is this Engelman spruce, Jerry Morris. This one was also most likely given to the collection by Rich Air. If you have this Engelman spruce in your collection, you may have seen it named Jerry Morris WB uh, for Witches Brew. Um, when you get to see the whole specimen, uh, you can really appreciate its nice compact form. But as you can see in this picture, it does have attractive bluish green needles and that reddish bark. Indigo Eyes Bosnian Pine is one Marissa and I both really love because we love those young blue cones. Um, not seen here, one of the things I definitely love about uh, Bosnian pines is when those buds start really getting big and bulgy in the spring and they're that nice white color. It's a great contrast with those dark blue cones. Um, this one has uh, is an inter intermediate grower and it's semi-dwarf. So it's probably gonna get a little bit bigger, has a more open habit than say compact gem. Um, it is out in the trade now. Uh, I, I'm gonna guess you've probably seen it. And in general, uh, we're, we're having very good luck growing Bosnian pines in this area. Okay, we, uh, Marissa pointed this out earlier and there really is a lot to like about this common juniper as long as you don't touch it. Uh, it is extremely, extremely prickly. And, but having said that, I, I do love it for its upright form. Those main branches really extend outward. And then you've got those secondary pendulous branching um, that really uh, just gives it a graceful look. But you've got to give this one some room uh, because those branches really need to spread out. And if you do, I think you really would like this unique texture and shape in the garden. I'm devoting an entire slide to this conifer for a couple reasons. One, I think you're gonna see more of it in the trade. I think you're going to see a lot more of it in the trade and because I really like it quite a bit. So much so that I added one to my personal collection last year. Um, it has the most terrific blue color 
that um, again, my camera just isn't capturing. This picture is getting close, but it's getting close to the real color. Of course, this picture was taken in December. So, um, you know, late fall, early winter sunlight is, can play real havoc on uh, cameras taking pictures. But in any event, um, this pine is also called Balkan pine. Now the species is reported to be as cold hardy as down to minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it's also very tolerant of wind. Well, we don't get quite that cold here in Kansas City, um, but boy, do we have a lot of wind. Uh, even if you're in town, you're experiencing a lot of wind because we are right on the edge of the plains where the wind comes sweeping down. So that's a nice uh, feature, um, uh, well, a good characteristic for conifers in this area. Now, if I've perked your interest at all and you wanna see how blue it is, go to the ACS website, search for the conifer cultivar, search for this cultivar. And there's a picture of it from Isley, from the Jean Isley Memorial Garden. And you will see just how blue it is and how it got its name. We have two Graceful Grace Douglas firs in our collection. The one that's shown here is a good focal point in our south circle bed. Uh, we don't know if this specimen was staked in an early age or not, uh, but it certainly fits our garden well because um, it's not taking up a lot of room. Uh, now this cultivar has been in the trade since the early 80s. I think ours probably has a little bit of filling in to do, and we look forward to seeing how it's gonna to continue to grow. So again, if you like Bosnian pines like I do, and if you like some really long, hard to pronounce names, you know, try saying that or try getting that to fit on your conifer label. Um, here's a conifer for you. Uh, this one is granted, it's kind of, oops, Sorry, folks. Oh, what's happening? Okay, so this one is sandwiched in between these conifers, but still, even if it weren't, um, I can tell that it's got a really tight upright form and those distinctive, very attractive dark green needles. Another one that I think is, is good for gardens. Okay, this Mucronata Norway spruce is also called the Mucronata pointed or sharp leaf Norway spruce, likely because Mucronata translates into pointed in Latin. Now, another notable point about this cultivar is its age. It, the cultivar, originated as a seedling selection from a garden at Versailles, France in 1835. Yes, I said 1835. And um, it, was it was first described in Loudon's 1842 Encyclopedia of Trees and Shrubs. So I'm kind of guessing this one must be pretty good since it's been around for 186 years. And, and as you can see here in our garden, um, uh, it is displaying a very nice, tight, slow growing shape and those very attractive dark green needles. But I do know it's gonna get big over time. If you haven't seen the one at Hidden Lake Gardens, you could look at their picture. You'll see how big it's gonna get. Okay guys, well finally, here we are, finally at my last picture is our 20 year old DeGroot Spire that I really just wanted to share with you because most of the year you really kind of can't see this. It's hidden behind the bald cypresses. And when you visit in the summertime, you might miss it. So, and that would be a shame because this really is a very nice specimen of the cultivar. Well, so those are some of our specimens. And now I just wanna share with you something that's gonna be happening for us next year, or the, I'm sorry, this year. 
we're adding on. Um, here in the rough and in the snow is our future new 1200 square foot conifer bed that's gonna be directly across and north of the existing conifer garden. Uh, prep work started last fall on removing a variety of perennials and shrubs. Um, and work has even continued after I took these pictures. So we will start planting this year, but first we're gonna work on a plan to, or develop a plan for the size and the shape and the number of conifers for the bed. And then we'll work to identify some cultivars that will you know, be best fit our plan. Um, so you'll wanna check this out on a future visit. And some other things you might wanna check out Marissa is going to share with you now. So we have a massive Pinostrobus broom at Powell Gardens. Um, it's actually located right next to our chapel study. Um, I believe these white pines are close to 30 years old. And um, I mean, ever since I first started working at Powell, I noticed this before I even knew what it was. I was like, what is that crazy thing in that tree? And then um, Deb finally got to see it a few weeks ago. And um, I definitely knew it was special with her response because she was just in awe. And so, um, yeah, so if you guys ever get a chance to come out to Powell Gardens, this is definitely something you should come check out along with our conifer garden. And if you still need a reason to come out to Powell Gardens, we have four festivals every year. In the spring, we have our Bloom Fest. So if you guys like bulbs, um, come on out because we have hundreds of thousands of bulbs. Um, the gardeners usually spend most of November planting anywhere from 50,000 to 75,000 bulbs every year. And um, we have bulbs ranging from grape hyacinth to daffodils to tulips to different varieties of tulips. It's, it's very beautiful. It's something that um, you guys would love to come out and see. Um, and then in the summertime, we have our Festival of Butterflies. Um, this is a fan favorite. We have our Tropical Butterfly Conservatory at the Visitor Center. And then you can take the Monarch Migration Path through the gardens all the way to our native butterfly habitat. Um, and that is really cool. It's very interactive. You can touch the butterflies. You can have them land on you. It's really cool. And in the fall, starting this year, we're gonna have a new festival. It's gonna be called Harvest Days. And it's just really gonna showcase all of the exciting and fun things that happen in the Midwest in the fall time. So um, that's something really exciting to come check out. And lastly, in the winter, we have our annual Festival of Lights display. Um, it's about four years old. This next year will be our fifth year doing it. And every single year, it gets bigger and bigger. We order more lights for it every year. Um, it, has, it is just beautiful. It goes through our Dogwood and Magnolia walks all the way through Heartland Harvest Garden. And it's just really exciting to be able to get out in the wintertime and walk around and see beautiful Christmas lights. Okay, thanks, Marissa. Well, everyone, um, that's, that is our, the end of our presentation about Paul Gardens and the Conifer Reference Garden. Um, for those of you who are kind of asking yourself, gee, how can we get out to Paul and see the conifer reference garden? Well, here's your answer. You can come to the 2023 ACS Central Region Convention. That'll be hosted by the Greater Kansas City Metro. Uh, last year, a small group of volunteers joined me in planning the event. We already have some nice conifer gardens lined up in both Missouri and Kansas. And we're planning a one day pre-tour event for the Thursday night, Friday morning before the, the conference um, that will showcase Paul, Paul Gardens and our conifer garden. Uh, in addition to touring the gardens Friday morning, we plan to offer a couple education classes and lunch. And then on Thursday night, 
uh, attendees will be able to gather for some food, some music, and maybe even some conifer shopping. So we don't have our dates yet. Um, so for now, just tell your friends and make your plans to come to Kansas City in 2023. If we don't see you sooner, we look forward to seeing you then. So on behalf of myself and Marissa, thank you all so much for attending today. And I want to thank Byron and David for asking us to do this. Um, and Marissa, I especially want to thank you for so willingly agreeing to join me. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. And I guess that means it's question time. Thank you, Deb and Marissa. That was an absolutely wonderful presentation. Uh, to cap off all of the presentations, they were all wonderful. Uh, folks, as you know, submit your questions via the chat window. There are already questions in the queue and Sherry, uh, Jeff and Jennifer, if you would just read those out uh, to Deb and Marissa, start whenever you'd like. Okay, um, from Mark Oberman, he says, Ife Jones architecture is another great reason to visit the Powell Garden. Definitely. And, and was, from Steve, sorry. I was just going to say, you know, E. Fay Jones was one of the disciples of Frank Lloyd Wright. Ah, okay. Um, from Steve Murray to everyone, I can't wait for mine to start making these. I think he's referring to your PD minaret. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Dave and I, we have a couple of Shawnee Braves. Uh, they're about three years old, and uh, the one that gets the most water has started making knees, which is pretty amazing here in Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, very cool bark. You know, that's, that's interesting because we haven't found any knees from the PV yellow or even from the species. Mm -hmm. Well, we were pretty surprised. <laughs> Um, from Jeff and Jennifer Harvey, they wanted to know behind the um, Connecticut Turnpike, is that a juniper? Oh, that was the Juniperus communis oblonga pendula. Okay. The really prickly one. <laughs> yeah. That needs and a from, I, sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, from Byron Baxter, uh, he says the uh, G-L-E-H-N-I-I -I equals the Jesuensis, J-E-Z-O-E-N-S-I-S. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, yes. I just wanted to clarify that. The original plant was at John Mitch Nursery in Oregon, uh, and he, he introduced it as a Jesuensis. The cultivar was Cheeto Samaro. Subsequent to that, people said they didn't think so. They thought it was a glenii, which was as it was labeled there in the arboretum. Uh, so it doesn't matter really whether it's a Yezuensis or a glenii because the Cheeto Samaro is all you need to know. And that is a beautiful plant. Yes. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up, Byron, because it is labeled as Jesuensis in the conif conifer garden right now. But when I was doing more research on all these cultivars, um, that's where the discussion came up. And on the ACS website, it is listed as a glenii. So the debate mm -hmm. continues, I'm sure. And, and I think it, it's a legitimate argument for academia to have. Uh, my personal feeling is out of respect for John Mitch, I'll accept his position that he introduced it as a Jesuensis. So okay. the debate so can continue. You're suggesting that I, I don't ask Marissa to change the label. <laughs> no, it's debatable. Yes, it is. Okay. And then from Sylvia Popelka, uh, she asks if Rich and Susan Eyre are still in Illinois. And as far as I know, they moved to New Mexico. 
uh, well, they after I wasn't really sure where they were going after they sold the, the nursery. Yeah. So I yeah, don't that's know where, where they are. Yeah, they're in New Mexico, um, Albuquerque. Albuquerque. And from Mark Chapman to everyone, oh yeah, New Mexico. Um, Vicki asks, is the pine broom too large to harvest? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm not a broom hunter. I'm sure some of you out there are. What do you guys think? I'll weigh in on that. The, the answer is no. And the really nice thing about it is it's not at the very top of the tree. <laughs> As is so often the case, it's reachable. So are you saying, right. Byron, that when you, to get samples from the broom, you have to take the whole broom? You should never do that. No. And that, that broom is so old, you want to get the new wood off of it anyway, the two-year-old wood at the, at the oldest. And uh, typically that's going to be on the edges near the top. So no, it, it, you never risk losing the plant by taking the whole broom. Maybe an even more important point is if you ever see any cones on that, grab them. Oh, well, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Who would we send them to, Dennis? You? Hi, Dennis. Hi. No, I think that uh, there's probably some other people that can uh, do a little better with, uh, with the raw materials than I can. <laughs> okay, Marissa, we'll have to start looking for cones. Okay. Um, Steve Murray says it all sounds great. And from Wanda, she says, thank you. You're welcome, Wanda. Uh, Sylvia Papelka uh, says, your Frankie boy is great. Mine died, sadly. Perhaps too much water. Any suggestions? Well, um, hmm. Too much water. Well, this one doesn't get too much water. Um, now, here's an interesting thing about where Frankie Boy is, and you might have noticed it. It's under this very large sprawling mimosa tree. The mimosa tree, so obviously it's, it's, that's throwing a lot of shade. Uh, but guess what? The mimosa tree is going to be going away this March because, was it two summers ago, Marissa? Yeah, it was the summer before last that it was hit by lightning and it's got major splits in the trunk. And so we've got to get it out of there because at any moment, if any one of those major branches came down, it would take out a lot of other plant material with it. So I've had some experience growing Frankie Boy in shade. It seems to like a little, a little bit of shade. I'm not saying full shade. Maybe somebody else can chime in on that. And then John Chapman uh, says to you, excellent presentation, beautiful fo photos. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also from Jean Ch Thompson says, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. Uh, Susan Weber, thanks so much, Deb and Marissa. Wonderful presentation. Thanks, Susan. Hi. Hi, Mike. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Karen Miller asked how many conifers are in the collection? We have a little over a hundred specimens and most of them are this, you know, in a very maturing size. <clears throat> I think my last count was 107. But we will be adding more conifers to the existing beds this summer. Um, as Marissa went and I went through and did our evaluation last year, um, there were, of course, some specimens that we had to make some hard decisions and a couple euthanasias, you know, had to happen. So we have a few places where we'll want to be adding some new cultivars. Mm -hmm. And uh, please ask, uh, since Rich and Sue are in New Mexico, what's happened with his Illinois nursery? Oh gosh, 
I don't know, anybody in Illinois know the answer to that? The, uh, the only thing that I can add, um, Deb, is that uh, it's, uh, they were trying to sell it, uh, and they, uh, they've had a couple of sales to, uh, uh, to get rid of their stock. I, I've got to believe that it's, uh, it's no longer uh, functioning. Yeah. Uh, Steve, uh, Murray, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Sherry. I was just going to say, I happen to... Uh, look at a um, inventory list of when he was what he was trying to sell his his collection or the I mean the inventory at the nursery and it's just amazing to me both the number and the the variety of you know cultivars that that he had in that one place just amazing it was definitely a go-to place each year yeah uh, Steve Murray asks, mine is in full sun and no irrigation and is doing fine. That must be your reference to the Frankie boy. Yep, good, because Frankie boy is going to be in full sun pretty soon. Okay, and Mark Butler uh, wants to know, do you have any Pinus uh, Teadia? T-A-E-D-A. No, we do not. Does he recommend, do you recommend that one? To whomever asked that question? I, I was just wondering if you had, an, if, if, I don't know, I was just asking because I was wondering if it would grow in your zone. Uh, no, we don't. Is that one that you recommend? Do you like that one? Um, I would like to, I would like to see some growing north, but I mean, it's a southern pine, so oh, I, okay. I just was wondering. Right. Well, you know, we were technically listed as a uh, zone 6A, but as we're all experiencing the change in, well, perhaps the temporary change in our climate, uh, you know, we're probably really a more reliable 6B zone, but this winter, we have got to be at least a 7A. We have yet to go below 10 degrees for an overnight low. That might change next week, but it'll be such a, it'll be like a one night event. So we don't, we're not normally that warm, but who knows what's going to happen. Thanks, Mark. And that's the end of the questions that I see. I don't see any more in the chat. That would be correct. Okay. Let, me throw out, let me throw out a comment. Uh, it's amazing to me um, the number of plants that you have in the garden that I've effectively killed in a Michigan winter. <laughs> well, I know you're in a warmer place right now, Dennis, but maybe you should just move a zone or two further south. <laughs> too, that, would you too stop much, the screen time, time so we can see faces? Well, listen, guys, if you have any more questions after you leave today, um, here's the website again for Paul Gardens. And then uh, please feel free to either email Marissa or myself with any questions. And thanks again so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. At this point, since there aren't any more questions, uh, David Speth, would, would you care to make any more announcements? This will be the last chance. This is our last, our grand finale. <laughs> yes, I, I, no, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, most everybody has, has heard the announcements that I have, but I'll go over them real quickly. Um, 